long as you're willing to work. Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. Mm -hmm. And on today's episode, I have a working woman in the building who's making that money and advocating for black women getting that honey. We have none (laughs) other than the Cody Oliver in the building. Hello, hello, hello. Y'all, if you have been like under a rock or something and you are not (laughs) familiar with the Cody Oliver, I'm sure you have heard of her brands, one of which being Black Love, the Black Love, which um, has been like a staple in the black community. I think that our generation, I don't know how old you are, so I just always be saying our generation because I just be guessing. I'm 39. Okay, so we in the same. I'll be 40 shortly. Okay, okay. So we in the same generation. I feel like black love has been a staple in our community of a positive representation of healthy, happy black couples. So Yes, healthy being the critical word. That part. um, With with so many other, like, examples of what we don't want, I Mm -hmm. think that it's just so important to have, you know, a, um, a community because it's so much more than just content a a community that you've built so what was the mission behind black love like the initial thought the initial thought was um finding an example like my parents were divorced so people telling me that I'm more likely to get divorced there was a a quote-unquote black marriage crisis at the time that this idea came to me um black women you know the more degrees we have we're told the less likely we are to find a man and I had a friend in particular who was pretty bitter after a breakup and she was like, oh, no one's happy. Like, who's out there? Like, like I just, I don't see it. Mm-hmm. And it kind of became my mission to show it to her. Um, this was at the same time that the Obamas were being elected into office. I always say both of them because we were looking at both of them. Um, and I was like, I know what it feels like to see them. We all felt that. We felt both the like, oh, look at this beautiful black couple, black love. But we also felt like, hey, if he can be president, anybody, any of us can, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like that that belief that if you see, if you see it, you can be it. And so I was like, I just have to create a place where black love stories live. Mm. And what was your relationship status at the time? Single. Oh, I didn't know that. So did yeah. you, so what was the initial thought? Was it, I'm going to just have conversations yeah. with black couples? Like what was in, yeah. your, in your mind? The initial thought was a, like a documentary in the okay. back of my mind. At that time, I was in grad school for film producing. I had like, documentaries weren't even cool in my mind, right? And so I was like, no, 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 that's that's not it. And also, I don't know the first thing about making a documentary at that time. And so I decided to do a coffee table book. I was like, it's a coffee table book. And I also didn't know a lot of happily married couples. Mm -hmm. I had, my parents were divorced. A lot of uh, my aunts and uncles were. I had one aunt and uncle that were together. Um, And so my cousin, I have a cousin who's, who's, raised in Chicago, and she was like, I know a bunch of happy black couples, you know, because Chicago's the land of happy black people, I guess. <laughs> and so we went out there, and we did a bunch of audio interviews and took pictures and, you know, for this coffee table book that never happened um, for a bunch of reasons. But that's what I decided it should be. And and I know even then, like, I was selling it short because the documentary was in my head, but I was like, nah. And um, ultimately, a lot happened, like, personally in my life. My dad got sick, et cetera. So it was just hard to keep it moving on top of finishing grad school and working and all of that stuff. And so fast forward, that was, like, 2008. Fast forward to 2013 when I met Tommy, who is a writer, director, producer, so many other things. But at the time meeting him, like, I knew that about him and that he was a cinematographer. And um, I told him about the idea early on. Like, we were dating immediately. So I told him about the idea pretty early, and he was like, we should just do it. Because I told him, like, I think it's a documentary. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. Because y'all were just dating at this Yeah, time. yeah. He's a producer, though. So he's like, let's go. There's nothing holding you back. Come on, let's go. He's also a cinematographer. So he's like, I can shoot it. So what are we doing? Seven us. Yeah. 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 And the rest is history. Basically. So when you come up with an idea like this, I think the part that the people on the outside looking mm-hmm. in don't often realize mm-hmm. is that when you come up with this great idea who funds it mm. at that time us mm. like the goal so there's a very clear um 
a pretty clear strategy for making a documentary or indie film um, as a first time filmmaker. Tommy had made produced two movies at that point, one that he directed as well. I had been behind the scenes, right? I went to grad school for film. I worked at a studio. I worked at a nonprofit. So the clearest strategy there is like, Make it, get grants, you know, raise some money, do crowdfunding. Like crowd, that was that was new. Kickstarter and all mm-hmm. that was, you know, a thing then. Still is, I believe, but you know, it was pretty new. So that's the strategy. Do that, make the thing, put it in the festivals, film festivals, and then HBO will pick it up and put it on TV, right? That was essentially the goal. Um, and we were like so a couple of things happened. I also worked for Canon. I did PR for Canon for a while, the camera company, Mm -hmm. and they had cinema cameras. And so my job was to connect them to filmmakers. So we convinced Canon to give Tommy a camera loan as a cinematographer and to make Black Love. And they did. So free equipment. So that's one leg up, right? Mm -hmm. We um, applied for a lot of grants and we were denied, denied, denied. We were told over and over again, like, I don't see it. Um, there was one grant that we did receive, but then also we we did fundraise. We wrote letters to people that we felt like would care, like literally b- black couples um, that we knew peripherally. We wrote letters and um, got a little bit of money that way. We even got miles. We literally like got miles from two people so that we could travel to mm-hmm. do the interview. So all of that helped make it happen. But ultimately, we were responsible for it. We were funding it. We got mm-hmm. that grant. We got was want to say. I want to say like twenty thousand um, dollars, but we were traveling all all over the country to do these interviews. We were paying for an editor, um, and you know, doing all of that ourselves with like, you know, that was it. And so, did it reach where you wanted it to go in the grand scheme in of the things? Grand, did like to Black this day, Love become? Oh yes. yeah, for sure, it really did. I, um, like a lot of people ask, like, did you expect it to do X Y Z? And it's like, on the one hand, yes. Because I knew that we needed it. Mm-hmm. We, me and Tommy needed it. Like our people needed it. We knew that there was an audience for it. Um, and we knew how important it could be. So that's the yes, right? But you're always like still astonished. Like, oh, it worked. You mm-hmm. know, we did it. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, yeah, I'm super proud of it. I'm so glad we also tapped out on the docu-series when we did, which was six seasons in. Um, but from the get-go, we knew we wanted it to be more than the docu-series and more than romantic love. We knew we wanted to talk about family and parenthood and and friendship and self-love. Um, and so we've done that since we launched the docu-series in 2017 and we launched the Black Love Summit and um, BlackLove.com in 2018. So why is it over? Why did it end? Mm-hmm. Please. I needed to get on that couch. Like, that was on my vision board. Me and my husband, we need to get on the couch. I would stalk and comment and all of the things. And I got onto a couch. You did. I did get onto a couch. So shout out to God because that manifestation did come about. But what happened? Should I be sad? Because I don't think you're sad about it being over. Well, okay, a couple of things. First of all, to be clear... Uh, Girl Stop Playing listeners, Coriel and her husband can be seen right now thank on you. Couch Conversations on, on the on, Black God Love Plus app and Black Love's YouTube channel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that was amazing and wonderful. And got, it was certainly manifested, but I've also been following you. Okay. Leave the comments and the DMs because some, people like me and Coriel do read them. We do. So, like, I, you know, very familiar with you. And so I was very excited when our producer was like, um, Coriel, um, applied. I'm like, what? Whatever she said in the interview, that's it. She in. Let's go. I love it. So, you know, that's very real. And um, so why did the docuseries end? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, since the very beginning, Tommy and I have been doing these interviews, just the two of us. We wanted to create an intimate space for that conversation to be as vulnerable and transparent as possible with Mm -hmm. the couple. So it's the two of us and the two of them. And cameras, two cameras, and nothing else, no one else. No PA, no sound tech, nothing. We did all of it. Mm. And that was very taxing on our time. I mean, every single interview, there was no like, oh, hey, I can't be there that day. Can you hire? No. So that was very taxing on our time and energy. And as we had three children over the course of Black Love, as we, as my husband launched a TV and film production company, Confluential Films, and not just launching the company, he was a full-time producer, right? So he was producing movies and TV and stuff at the same time. He did two whole documentaries, which require like shooting people, filming people all the time. So all that was happening and I'm having to schedule, you know, big celebs around my husband. Like, oh, well, he's not available that day. So, you know what I mean? Like, it was just hard. It was hard. And, um, but we didn't want to compromise on that approach. Mm-hmm. 
we didn't want to suddenly say, all right, well, let's just have someone else We'll just get it. somebody else, yeah. Um, so that was one of the reasons. Um, the other reason was that we wanted to kind of quit, kind of quit while we were ahead. Um, the reality is, like, we can't control people's relationships. We've interviewed over 200 couples, like, probably 250 couples, and we've had less than 10 divorces. But people still wanted to, like, focus on that. And um, I didn't want it to become about that. And so... I wanted us to to quit while we were ahead and truly just um, truly just leave it all on the field, you know. So did you ever? And I'm I'm assuming the answer is yes because mm-hmm. you know we're artists, we're sensitive about our shit. This is a baby that you have birthed. Yes, then yes. Mm-hmm. Was it, the what question. is it a bittersweet a bittersweet moment like making the decision that it's the coming to it. an end? Have you dealt sure. with people like me who are like, girl, bring this couch back? For sure. No, it's totally bittersweet. And I would say the hardest part for me has been I loved meeting couples and being like, ooh, I know what I want to do. I want to put you on Black Club. You know what I mean? Like wanting to tell their stories, wanting to tell these unique, inspiring stories. And I say unique. Like we never like professed that like every couple on Black Love was unique as much as I would just meet somebody and get a nugget and be like, oh, somebody, somebody else needs to hear your story. Somebody else needs to hear that. And I don't, I don't have that in the same way. We still have all these platforms. I can still do a conversation, a, an event, a new show, a this or that. But that platform is not the same. And so when I meet couples that are interesting, I'm kind of just like, okay, cool. You know, it's like put it in my, you know, put it on my notebook and um, we'll see what, what we do. What's in that notebook? Huh. What's like oh, man. grand scheme yeah. of things, like the next? Yeah. And do you feel pressure for there to be a next big thing? Mm. Huh. Let me, let me think on that one. But as far as like what's in the notebook, so much has happened since Black Love docuseries, right? We launched in 2017, six seasons. While doing that, we started the Black Love Podcast Network. We have eight podcasts. And so just being able to tell some of those individual stories and journeys through that, right? So we have parent, I mean, not that good to go through each one, but just the breadth of it, right? We've got two parenting podcasts. We have a men's wellness series. We have a podcast called Soul Affirmations, where if you saw Felicia and Kariga Bailey in season five, discussing the transition of their first daughter the day she was born, like, you know that these are incredible people who like, who, who we all can learn from and learn what love looks like and not just from a place of sadness, like Mm -hmm. understanding the the breadth of grief and what it is. And so we have a podcast with them. And then we also have a podcast with the amazing Clarks, which most people know as the couple where she was like, I got a tattoo when we were broken up. And he was like, where? On my booty. Where? On my booty. Say it again. On my booty. So they're like hilarious. And, you know, second marriage, they're in their 50s. Like they're just Mm. full of knowledge and funny. And so just all these different stories that we're able to tell through the podcast, through our digital series, Light Couch Conversations, where we've had Deval and Kadeen host and Tab and Chance and now Ace Hood and Sheila Marie. And so that notebook consists of all of that. You know, it consists of doula dads, which is a series that we did highlighting the father's role in pregnancy and childbirth. So like those are the things in the notebook. And when you ask about like the next big thing, right, frankly, it's like it being easier. You know what I mean? Like I, I, my team, we are like pushing these things into existence um, like everybody else. Right. Like trying to work with brands and trying to, you know, sell tickets to events and like that juggle of revenue and purpose. Um, And it is a journey. Mm -hmm. It's a journey that like I went to I studied broadcast journalism and film, not CEOing. Okay. That part. And so the learning, the the mistakes, the the leadership, the team building or lack thereof, you know, um, while having three kids. Well, and I don't mean while they're existing. I mean like I had them over the course of this process, over the course of this professional journey. There's just so much stretching and um stretching of the mind and the body. Um and so so what's next is like being able to do those things while also like taking care of myself and my family, you know, mm-hmm. like having some peace. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's so much work and it can feel so lonely, especially when it appears from the outside that you have it all together. That's annoying as hell. It's like, <laughs> thank you. 
But that yeah. kind of does me yeah. a disservice yeah. because now you don't want to help me. Now you're not reaching Girl. out for support. You know, now yeah. you're not reaching out to help because yeah. you think I got it all together. Yeah. I gl- I'm glad I make it look like I do. I'm glad I don't look like what I've been through. Right. But I'm still going through some things. It's, yeah. I don't just have it made in the shade. And I yeah. think that's the part that social media kind of does a disservice because people expect that once you've achieved this thing or made it to this certain place, you're living a good life. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm still, no. it's still hard. Like it still takes work for me to be able to do these things. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of hard and doing the work, your crazy self went from producing this documentary to doing yeah. what I think is one of the hardest things in life, which is producing an event. Yeah. So what's the mission and vision behind the Black Love Summit? Because yeah. there has to be a strong mission for you to be doing this hard thing. Six years in a row. Of hard of hardness. Yeah. So the Black Love Summit really is has always been our opportunity to talk to our people in person. Right? Like, we wanted to take the realness, the rawness, the transparency... Um, and the relatability of the Black Love docuseries and bring that wherever we go because that's what we realized was unique was the vulnerability. That's also Mm -hmm. why we kept that intimate space of the two of us and the two of them. We bring that to blacklove.com with first-person stories, not just articles about some stuff, but like people talking about their own journeys. And we bring that in person with the Black Love Summit. Um, and so we there we try to make sure that we're covering romantic love, but also like parenthood, also like getting your money right, like all of these ways that we want to live better. Right. And that we can practice self-love and we can practice um, honing our relationships from romantic to familial. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are that's the, how the breadth of topics work. Um, and we just bring people in that we respect and admire and or that have been on the show of which we still respect and admire them but we we try to make sure it's a combination of folks that our audience is familiar with because they've seen them on our platforms mm-hmm. but also people that we're like that's a voice y'all need to be hearing from mm-hmm. like yours do hey. you like mine do you feel pressure in, on your own relationship mm-hmm. being in the spotlight it's you can't really hide because especially with the public platform like this with the yeah. platform being focused on marriage it's like well what y'all doing up in y'all marriage well, yeah. how y'all? so do you feel obviously nobody's perfect but do you ever feel like you have to keep up appearances or you have to appear to be perfect um I don't feel like I have to appear to be perfect um but I did have to reconcile what I wanted and expected from Tommy in this space and what I got, or rather who he is, right? Like, I had black love in my soul before I met him. Mm-hmm. And then I met him, and he was down for it, you know, within a month. Like, I'm talking about, we probably talked about it two weeks after we met. Um, and, of course, I knew he had other projects and things that he wanted to do. But there was a time that I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Like, this is we're just going to make this show, and we're going to write books about it, and we're going to be influencers before influencer was even really a term. Mm -hmm. But I was like, well, we're going to, this is the work that we're doing and everything else is kind of on the side. Right. And for him, his passion is making movies and TV and building a business um, or businesses ultimately. And I had to really reconcile, like, I'm be sure I probably never said this before. Like, why are we not showing up like Deval and Kadeen? You know what I mean? Like at the, at the time, right. Really reconcile that, like, what I wanted us to show up as um, with what our actual goals are as individuals. And so that was probably, and still, still sometimes I think I'm getting, I'm much more used to it now, but that was actually the biggest challenge. It wasn't even being perfect. Maybe that was for a period actually, because when we had children, we went through it. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I I try to be very honest though and transparent about like, the imperfections over here. <laughs> yeah, and, and none of us are perfect. Even, yeah. you know, I think that it's one thing to, because I am very public about my love for yeah. my husband. Yeah. So much so, and and I think the a part of the reason is we will scream from the mountaintops when a man does us wrong. Yeah. But then yes. when someone is Agreed. doing right, like I think we should give just as much attention to that. Um, yeah. But nothing is perfect, and I think it's so important that we do have conversations that even if we look happy as hell, yeah. we're still working things out. Yeah. Throw in some babies in the mix, girl, and even the happiest, healthiest couple is gonna have some issues what do you think was the biggest lesson um or or not even the biggest lesson learned how do you think having children 
impacted your marriage? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was huge, but I have to like sort of explain the layers, right? So we met and moved in together in three months. Wow. We were engaged in six. We were married one, we were married a year, less than a year and a half after we met. And then we were pregnant 11 months later. So it's like within two years, we were living together, married and pregnant. Um, maybe two and a half, we actually like were parents, but like all of that happened. We were, and we were working together. All of that was happening. And in a sense, we were still getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. We knew what we knew to decide, let's get married. We have the same goals and we make each other happy. And like, we know what we want it to be in 10 years and 20 years and da 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 da. We know what the goal is, but like, we were still getting to know each other in a lot of ways. And then you have a child and now you're getting to know how that person acts without sleep. You know what I mean? Like the, the worst version of them. Right. And you're learning what their gender role, uh, you know, understanding is. And, and again, none of that, ultimately, those individual things weren't problems. It was all of it. We actually had a really good, um, I would say, parenting approach because we both just wanted to be parents so bad that nothing was a problem, right? It was like the poop, the pee, the late nights, whatever, we going to do it. Um, but it was also the working together. It was all of those things that were happening at the same time. And and then just like surviving that and then getting pregnant with twins. That. So so kids shook things up though too, because for the for the nature reasons, I was the person physically going through all of this while we both are showing up at work every day. Right? So that that made it a lot harder for me and and I think created more of a disconnect too. Mm -hmm. Cause he's also a very no nonsense professional. Um, and so for him, it's like the work, the work still got to get done. That's not, that doesn't mean my husband's like cracking the whip. Like you better go to work. It's not that, but it's kind of like, but this, this is what's needed. So we got to figure out how to get it done and I can do this. You still got to do that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it was just, it was the compounded everything that kids, uh, I don't want to say made worse. What is the word? Like, like, like just had an impact on, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And how, how far apart are the girl? The, these kids are two years apart. Okay. So you're crazy as well. Yeah. yeah that, but I, I had, think it's going to work out for us. Three under three. At one point, it, at some point it's, things are going to turn around. Right. And it's going to be a benefit yeah. that they're this close together. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, I think so. Age, and at times but, it is, but yeah. like for the most part, it was just a lot. Mm -hmm. All these little people. It's still a lot. Yeah. Because the twins are four. Oof. How's four? Uh, uh, adorable and destructive. Terror. They are terrors. Um, I wanted to ask about, where did I want to go? I wanted to talk about, you said you had an expectation of how mm -hmm. you would show up in your mm -hmm. coupledom. Yeah. Do you still have that expectation? Because I think for women who find ourselves in this space and the the poor men who find, <laughs> who find themselves as our partners, they yeah. kind of get thrown into it. Yeah. And we had this conversation on the couch conversations yeah. of just the partners of the public person. Yeah. Yeah. How is that dynamic now? Because I don't think it's going to change. It's not like you're going to go into the shadows and, you know, like you're still no. very much. I would say front, front I have, I have learned how to, uh, you know, I don't, I would just say that I've learned what his boundaries are. And I don't, I truly don't have a desire for him to show up any differently online um, or in public. I really don't. And I have a great time. I, I enjoy social media, or at least I try to, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a fun place or it can be a fun place. Um, and so I try to just like do it for the fun of it. Um and I really, right now, I don't have a desire for him to change anything that he's doing. I will say we have a longstanding um, issue, I guess, that I'm not, I was going to say people have picked up on. It's not like that deep where people are like, oh, I can tell that they're at odds here. No, but, but people comment on, which is that I am me and I am colorful and I like to dress up for occasions. And Tommy, you know, is on his Steve Jobs, right? He's like, I'm going to wear this black T-shirt and these pants every day. And so our um, so that is like a, a, a constant conversation and of, of acceptance versus. But could you just could you just do a little different just today, just this once, you know? And so that's probably way 
bigger of an issue to me than like social media in general. How do y'all handle that? Is Girl, it like we just, I'm going to agree to disagree. I'm just going to be mad. Yeah. It's a work in progress eight years into marriage. And we've known each other 10 years, but eight years in, um, we probably got in our biggest fight over it this summer. Because um, he want to wear something that she wanted him to wear? Girl, it wasn't even that. It was just, it was an, it was an occasion that I felt was an automatic, you're going to, Dress you're up. not going to wear your usual flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt. And he did. Meanwhile, I'm standing here in like a Alice and Olivia blazer dress and some hot pink so, heels, so getting is, my makeup done and hearing the flip-flops across the floor. Did he change? No! So this is the part of marriage that I think we need to put a pin in because... Yeah. The pick of the picking of your battles, mm -hmm. the yeah. having to choose your words wisely, the yeah. having to y'all still left the house and went somewhere and you still had to. Girl, did I? Yes, I did. How do you hold in those moments? Because that is one example. But if we're being honest, these are like yeah. not I don't want to say daily, but yeah. these are things. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's yeah. every day there's a decision to be made that y'all might not agree on. And at some point, y'all are both grown as hell and yeah. you're not going to tell me what to do. Yeah. And I'm sure yeah. you're like that on yeah. some topics, right? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what it is. You're going to have to figure it out. Right. What goes through your mind in those moments? And this is a personal question from a yes. new wife yeah. to a, from a, you know, from a new wife to an OG wife. Like, how do you talk yourself off the ledge? You're me when we were interviewing couples for Black Love. Because we would sit down and we'd be like, uh, we've been married a year and these are my questions. Yeah, <laughs> help me. Um, how do I, like I said, it's still a work in progress eight years in. Okay. I think for me, it's, I have found it's best. And, and, and it comes down to personalities too. Cause mm -hmm. what I'm about to say may not even work. It's best for me to articulate my issue. Um, have compassion and grace, like for his feelings or stance or position in this case. Um, but, but make sure I get it out. Cause if I hold it in, that's when I like, really will explode um and and just do my best to like figure out what the net net is I truly thought this last time I truly thought this last time that he was going to acquiesce I really did like when I when I did get upset about it and instead it became a conversation around like like this is this is me this is who I am like why would you want to change that and I'm like, eh, but I'm just asking, you know, for a little. But that's how deep it was for him, right? It's like, you know, I'm trying to like change who he is, and it's like, while I greatly disagree, and feel like a person should be able to like make a small adjustment, I understand where he's coming from is a completely different place than this is a small adjustment. Mm -hmm. And so it's like understanding or trying to understand where the other person is coming from, and how much can you impact that thing. Or is this just going to be a lifelong fight? And is that what you want? So is it going to be a lifelong fight? What you going to do? You just decided you just going to... I am doing my best to not care. Okay. To, like, accept that this is what it is. Mm. And and I guess now that we're getting into it, because this is the other part of it. This is a recent thing with uh, Haley Bieber and uh, Justin mm -hmm, Bieber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen the comments about them, and I've seen some comments about us, where people people will say, I just love how he always does him, and she like lets him do that and appreciates him, and and it's just funny people are assuming the other side of it. But I get the like, re like respecting someone who does them all the time, right? Without knowing the nuance of like his wife is pissed or not, right? Some are not, and so and so that part is interesting to me, and but ultimately I'm just doing like I really. I'm trying to just let it go. I am really trying to just let it go. I wish you well with that. Thank you. Because it was You'll see. Like now y'all, now I whoever's going to be watching like, mm, is definitely going to be looking and be like, oh, she, she did was not win that, that one. Yeah, she did not win yeah. that one. I think that's a man thing, though, honestly. Yeah. Major and you know, it's not an all man, you know, yeah. but because my husband don't be going either. But we've gotten to the place where it's like, let's just argue about it today because yeah. in 10 days when it's time for you to put that on, I don't want to argue on the day of. That part. Let's argue today. So yes, those, those are the adjustments we make. Yeah. We just, Lord, I'm telling all the tea, but I look, Tommy, don't be this mad. This is real. No, we need but help us, Tommy. We need help. We just went to a wedding that was a black tie wedding and they were serious. They had a mood board. They had black tie, all black, 
And, you know, if, if you're not, if you don't, you know, follow the rules, like, you know, we, we, we're not going to let you in. Now, I didn't see them turn anybody away, but I definitely was like, Tommy. You know, this is what he said when I first told him. He was like, they know me. No, ma'am. I was like, babe, babe. <gasps> Come on, That's man. next level right there. It's it's their wedding. Like, can we just? Yeah, no. He, He's I, serious. Can we just? Can you just try? Like, can I? I can help. Can you need me to help? And he was like, No, I got it. And I mean, a couple of days out, I was like, So what are you wearing? And he was like, I haven't decided yet. And that was my like, Let's argue about it now. But he didn't even want to talk about it. like he was giving me nothing. He was like, I haven't decided. I was like, You you haven't decided like um, whether you're gonna have. Something tailored or like you're, or what? And he was like, well, I'm going to pick something that's up there. I'm like, you ain't got no black tie in this closet. Anyway, ultimately he made it work. He did his thing. It was like a black shoe, jeans, black jeans. He didn't get kicked out though. And a and a tuxedo jacket okay. situation. And okay. he looked amazing. Okay. He did not get kicked out. I was still a little like this when we were in the car. Um, But he was cute. Okay. He was cute. He tried. He did. He did his version. And I appreciate. That's my things. Like I appreciate his version. But sometimes but give he, me something. Sometimes right. Sometimes his version is not trying. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, bruh. But I, I, and I can't even say like, oh, he did that for me. I don't know why he did it. Ultimately, I, that's the other thing. I kind of have to just let him do it and not make too much of a fuss. Other than you look great and just like let that be that. But yeah. So you know, I never know what I'm gonna get. And I and I, I've already told him though because the one the thing we fought over this summer, I was just like next time, I'm just like know that when we get on a red carpet, and I step away from you, this is why, and he's okay with it. Dang, yeah. Don't get no ideas. I don't want my husband to get no ideas. I need some. You got to conform, please. You got to conform. So <laughs> over the years, this is my this is my last question, but I have to ask you because I mm -hmm. feel like you are just like a resource because to have sat mm -hmm. in, if I could just be a fly on the wall for the unedited versions mm -hmm. of the conversations that you've been a witness mm -hmm. to, um, priceless. Mm -hmm. One of the mm -hmm. questions that I always ask anytime I have happily married couples sitting down, like, how what is that thing like mm -hmm. can you describe it one of the common denominators is always we were friends oh, like we yeah. like each other yeah. at the end forget all of this other stuff at the end of the day we like each other yeah what are like two or three common denominators I guess or conclusions that you could come to yeah after all of those conversations for a couple watching this like what are some takeaways that you can share just based on the conversations with the happy couples that you talk to Okay. So the main thing, to be perfectly honest with you, is what we call the commitment to being committed. Like, it's literally the people who choose each other all the time. Um, because you could be friends first, or you could not be, or, you know, all of those things. I think that stuff matters. But I think that every day you have to, like, be willing to do the work. And you either just, like, give up and don't do that, or you do. But both of you have to do it. Um, and so it was funny because, you know, we did interview all of these couples and we came to that conclusion. Someone said it maybe maybe in season one with us, like said it to us, the commitment to being committed. Um, and it stuck with us and we kind of observed it throughout, right, from infidelity to bankruptcy to, to, to disease and illness. You know, it's like the choice to show up for each other. Mm -hmm. Um but the funny part is, before we ever made the show, I, I had watched, we had watched this film called Meet the Patels. I, I used to work for a film festival. It was an, a documentary about this Indian um, actor, actually, in L.A., who let his mom set him up on these, um, Lord, let his mom do the arranged marriage thing. He's mm -hmm. American, or he's an American Indian, um, but his parents had an arranged marriage. And so through this really beautiful documentary, like the lesson of you make a choice to show up every day, no matter what. Like, of course, if somebody's bad to you or harming you, we're, that's a different conversation. But these folks in the film, you know, who had these arranged marriages, you're making a choice. You're checking some stuff off on paper, sure. You're letting your mama and her mama say, like, okay, I approve. And then you make a choice to show up and give your all. And I made a comment to my aunt and uncle, who had, who at the time had been married, like, 30 years, and um, I was like, yeah, it just seems like you just make a choice and commit to that. And they were like, duh. 
And this is before we ever did the show, right? So it just was like doubling, tripling down on that fact. Um, but like you, you choose it. And, and if there comes a point that you don't, you know, and you're really sure about why you don't. Um, but until then, like you choose to, to honor your, your vows, honor that person, honor the commitment that you made, you know? I got one last question. This is mm-hmm. the last one for real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think that as a single woman, your perception, it's like before you become a mom, you have an idea of the mm-hmm. type of mom you're going to be. I'm not going to do this. My yeah. kids ain't going to do that. And then you become a mom and your kids are doing all the things because you realize life yeah. is hard. Like yeah. shit is getting real. So I think a single woman, you say all these things. Uh, my husband will never do this. Mm-hmm. My man will never mm-hmm. do that. I got mm-hmm. this laundry list of deal breakers. Mm-hmm. Then you get married. Yeah. And not that you start selling, but you just realize the reality of things is different than the fantasy of yeah. things. Yeah. So having heard over 250 plus couples, your personal deal breakers, mm-hmm. like did your personal beliefs about what you mm-hmm. could handle, what you're willing to tolerate, did any of those things change based on the, the couples that you heard from? The short answer is I'm going to say no, because I didn't go into marriage or the or the um, experience of interviewing these couples with deal breakers. I didn't. Mm. I truly went in like curious. My parents got divorced when I was like 12 and I thought that they were good. And I was, I was struck and shocked by it. And that really is like half the reason why we're here. Right. Um, I wanted to understand like, what does it take to make a marriage work? So for me, it was like, I want to know all the bad things that happened in a marriage and how you got through it. Because we, because what I knew was that bad shit was going to happen. Infidelity wasn't even a deal breaker for me. I say wasn't for one reason and I can explain, but infidelity like wasn't even a deal breaker for me because it was like, I don't know what happens in a marriage. Like, I don't know what makes somebody do that. You know, I don't know what lull happened that, that, that someone makes a mistake and then it's apologetic. Like you made a commitment, like maybe you got to figure it out or not. You know what I'm saying? Again, there's certain things, people got their deal breakers. Or there's certain things that compound. But for me, it was like, I don't know. Y'all tell me. And so that really hasn't changed for me. Like, it's it's like, I don't know. Are, are you doing right by me? Do I, feel, do I feel good at my core about being here in this relationship? Um, if you do me wrong, do I feel like I can understand you're, where you're coming from, not like, I understand why you hurt me. I understand why you made a choice as a human. And I understand that you recognize you hurt me and you're willing to work on that. You know what I mean? We, we talked to Erica and Warren Campbell who shared, you know, their infidelity before I think they had actually shared it publicly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and learning how they worked through it, learning how they were both able to, he was able to just take whatever she gave him in terms of, anger or questions that she had and and they both and and she was able to own you know there's a lot of ways I pushed you away Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that anybody's saying it's okay for you to you know it just means that they're recognizing the humanity in one another and so that to me is like what matters most is like recognizing the humanity in each other and can I stay Mm mm-hmm I swear there was a part two. Oh, infidelity. Yes. Oh, I was coming back around to it. In, infi- <laughs> we was going to circle back. Don't worry. Infidelity is a deal breaker for Tommy. Is it? It is. What about you? It was never for me. But because it's a, a deal breaker for him, I now feel like if he to wants to cheat, yeah, yeah, yeah. then that means he out. You know what I mean? He knows this. I've said this to him because I'm like, that was not a deal breaker for me. I recognize like shit happens and I don't. I don't know what that shit is because I've never been married before now. Mm-hmm. But that's a deal breaker for him. So I'm like, if he ever did it, that means he pretty, he's in a dark place. Yeah, that means it's We're basically a dark place. over. Yeah, it's basically. Yeah, so. That's funny because I feel the same way and I feel some type of way for feeling that way because I don't mm. want to give you a green light. Let me look you in your eyes. I don't want to give you like a permission slip green light to go do something but I am a very logical person right exactly and this is a long life that we have to live and I think I would just be irrational yeah to to just not be able to even imagine that this is a possibility you know it's a possibility yeah exactly and and again that's one of those things that it's so easy to say what you will and will not do until life comes at you fast yeah yeah 
So that's the whole point of having platforms like this, having conversations. I appreciate you being real. I appreciate your willingness to put your life because in creating what you've created, you've literally put yourself um, out there, like for the world. And the world's not always so nice. No. They're not always so gentle. Um, and so I just want to give you your flowers for being willing to invest yourself, your time, your life. You've literally dedicated your life to the celebration of black love. And not many people are willing to do that. So thank you. Thank you. It is much needed. Um, if you if you've ever felt like your work was done in vain, please know that there are literal couples that are looking to your content for inspiration, for encouragement to keep on going. So look into the camera, let the people know Black Love Summit. They need to be there. They yes. need to download the app. Anything else they need to know? How how can they support you if they ain't following you? Like girl, stop. Sorry playing. for them. Right. Sorry stop for them. playing. Follow us at Black Love. Please make sure you're listening to the Black Love Podcast Network. You can even follow uh, Black Love Podcast Network on Instagram and uh, TikTok. And um, engage. Tell us what you want more of. Like, let us know. We're listening. We are checking the DMs and the comments. So, you know, thank y'all. Yes. Make sure y'all come check us out. Karen, yes. <laughs> because I will be in the building at the Black Love Summit. Thank y'all so, so much for tuning in. Make sure you comment below and let me know something that you took away from this conversation. Share this episode with a friend. If you are not subscribed, girl, stop playing. <laughs> I'll see you on the next episode. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content. And... Take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows. And I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as $5 a month, okay? Get in where you fit in and I'll see you on the inside.